there are some features of taking a psychiatric history that differ from other histories in medicine. We'll look at the main differences as well as some general tips. A fairly typical model is one of presenting complaint and its history, past psychiatric and medical problems, social and family history, drug history, substance use and forensic history, which is all combined with a mental state examination. So it can be tricky to remember each point. So you need a simple way to organize your history. Remembering the five S's is one such way. First is symptoms, where the presenting complaint and its history are discussed. For example, this could be mood disturbance or anxiety symptoms, amongst many others, and features of the complaint itself, like when did it start, has it worsened or progressed, are there any clear triggers, any exacerbating or relieving factors, as well as associated symptoms and the impact on daily life. Past psychiatric history can include previous diagnoses or admissions, and past medical history can also be relevant, so is worth asking about. Bear in mind that it can be difficult for people to discuss mental health issues, especially compared to perhaps physical problems that they have. Therefore, it's reasonable to open with asking them to talk generally about themselves, which not only helps to form a working relationship, but also gives you information that you'd likely ask for anyway. Also remember that having to repeat their past history to each professional they see may be upsetting and frustrating, so it's useful to have read their background in advance. The range of symptoms here is enormous, so we'll need some tailoring based on the presenting complaint and the context. Using depression as an example, mood is a core symptom, as is anhedonia and low energy but there are several others. SIG E caps is a great mnemonic to remember to cover these symptoms, but it can help generally as well. It stands for sleep, interests, feelings of guilt, energy levels, concentration, appetite, psychomotor features, and self-harm or suicide, but we'll get to that later. Next is social. A large portion of the history will have been gathered from the symptoms but social history tends to have a bigger impact than in more traditional medical histories, because it often contributes more to the symptoms themselves. These are features such as the living situation, along with who do they live with or have a relationship with, are there any children involved, for example that may prompt thinking of safeguarding, and when talking about the family, it's easier to ask about any relevant family history as often there are familial components to mental health problems. Job or schooling would also come up here, if that hasn't already been asked, as well as the impact the problem they're presenting with has had on the job or school. Forensic history can also be included here, which may then impact the risk assessment later on. The third S stands for substances, where I also include regular medication and confirming compliance with the medication if they've been prescribed any. Substances also include smoking and alcohol history, and importantly, any illicit or recreational drug use. This would include current and historic use. Food is also included here, including any binging or purging behaviour. Next is psychosis. It's a term used to describe symptoms associated with significant alteration to a person's perception, thoughts, mood or behaviour. Hallucinations are an example, defined as perceptions in the absence of a stimulus. Auditory hallucinations are the most common, and can mean hearing voices as a commentary or even as direct commands. Other hallucinations include visual, olfactory and touch. Delusions are fixed beliefs outside expected cultural norms, that are held despite evidence to the contrary. Examples being delusions of thought, like thought insertion, withdrawal or broadcasting, or delusions of reference, where ordinary stimuli are given particular importance. The classic example being the person believing the TV presenter is talking directly to them. Delusions, hallucinations, disorganised speech and behaviour are considered positive symptoms, where the person perceives more than standard sensations. But negative symptoms also exist like reduced speech, emotional blunting and self-neglect, 
where this takes away from the person's state of being. We then come to self-harm and suicide. This can be a very sensitive and delicate topic, so generally is best left towards the end of the consultation, by which time hopefully there is some rapport with the patient. This includes any thoughts of self-harm or suicide, and if they've ever acted upon them. Features to ask could be how they self-harmed, when the last time was, and why they feel they do it. This also presents an opportunity to review some of the physical harm that can be done as a result. With suicidal thoughts, it's important to know if there are any specific plans, any previous attempts, and if so, their reflection on them. Some particular risk factors for suicide include male sex, an age below 19 or above 45 years, previous attempts, substance use, the loss of rational thinking, a lack of social support or isolation, an organised plan and access to means, for example healthcare workers and farmers. But bear in mind that the absence of these factors does not mean an absence of risk. It's crucial also to remember that it's not only the risk to the person themselves that needs to be assessed, but also any risk to others.